and welcome to Myth Monsters. My name is Erin and I'll be your host for these little snack bite sized podcasts on folklore and mythical monsters from around the world. These podcasts focus on the actual cryptids, folklore and mythic monsters from global mythology rather than focusing on the full stories of heroes and their big adventures. I'll also be dropping in some references that they have to recent culture and where you can see these represented in modern day content so that you can learn more and get as obsessed as I am about these absolute legends of the mythological world. The sun is shining and summer is truly in full swing here in the UK. I spent the last week in the seafront city of Brighton and had the loveliest time writing this episode in pubs and cafes all around lovely East Sussex. And it's been quite lovely here too, actually. It's very cool at the moment, so I'm thoroughly enjoying it as your resident ginger. And this week, we are staying on the seafront, I suppose, on an island, much like the UK. And this week, we're heading over to Oceania, but not to the more common Australia, but to where the hobbits roam, New Zealand, for a Maori monster. Yes, this week, we are looking at the Tanifa. I also must apologise preemptively. I pronounced this very incorrectly last week when I was announcing it, so this is the actual pronunciation in Maori. So, just as a heads up. This monster was actually recommended for me to cover by one of my Kiwi pals, Corey, who very, very helpfully helped me figure out the pronunciations for this episode. So I'm very happily dedicating this family to him and his little family as they're growing soon as well, which is super exciting. But Corey, this goes out to you. Thank you so much for helping me this week. The Tanifa is described as many things, but they are most commonly a water beast. They take the form of whale sharks, great white sharks, crocodiles, large geckos or even driftwood, but they are always found in the water and are immensely large monsters. It's debated whether they are actually shapeshifters and they change their shape based on how deep the water levels are where they are based at the time, or if there are different water depth varieties of this monster too, which is definitely unique in our host of monsters. The Tanifa are responsible for creating many harbours leading out to the oceans within Maori or Polynesian mythology. I'll go more into this mythology and what they break up into, as it's one we've never really discussed before, but we'll get into that later. They're said to have carved out the harbours in both Wellington and Hokianga, as well as the entire Lake Waikaramona, and can cause landslides beside any lake or river that they are nearby. They are usually identified through spines or fins on their back and can sometimes even have wings and they are generally quite large, you can't really miss them. They can never make themselves any smaller so they do tend to stick out. They are said to have dragon or serpent-like faces with sharp teeth and very long forked tongues in which they use to ensnare their prey. However, in terms of appearance, that's about all we have on them. They are both male and female, we know this, and they are generally considered to be benevolent to the tribe they're associated with, because of course Maori and Polynesian folklore, a lot of it is tribal, but because of the connection between them and the tribe, they will have local priests to come down and communicate with the Tanifa to warn of oncoming enemies and generally help kill other tribes, as well as help drowning people associated with their actual tribe too. Now this is because these monsters were also considered protective guardians, or Keitiaki, who came from the Polynesian land of Hawaii, which is the ancient homeland of the Polynesians within their mythology. It's also sometimes referred to as the Maori underworld, where all of the Polynesian folklore and people came from before they were dispersed around the globe. The Tanifa were guardians of certain canoes, which went on to protect descendants of travelling tribes, and most of these tribes will have their own dedicated Tanifa. They make sure that the tribes uphold the traditions imposed by the tapu, which are sacred laws, and fun fact is where the English word taboo comes from. Again, I will go more into Maori and Polynesian mythology later in terms of their history, but they are a nomadic culture, Therefore, all of them would have separate canoes that are historic and linked to certain tribes, so that's why it's so important, and they would have singular Tanifa protecting them. However, 
The Tanifa are deadly to those who belong in other tribes, and are big enough to swallow people whole. In fact, there was one instance where a beast was killed, and inside its belly were men, women, and children, all undigested and completely whole and dead from suffocation. They were also known for kidnapping women and keeping them as wives when they fell up to it too, so a very Selkie-like procedure. They generally live in the caves of these bodies of waters within very strong currents, and if someone wanted to cross the water, they would need to leave offerings and an incantation in order to appease the Tanifa. Most commonly, it was a green twig and taro, which is a type of sweet potato and is bright purple. If you're a fan of Taiwanese bubble tea or boba like me, you will see this is a really popular flavour choice and the drinks are a lovely pastel purple colour. I'm not sure what they taste like though, I've always been put off by the colour. There's not really much on record about how long they live for, but we do know that they can be killed by just normal means of killing a large shark, for example. A bit of fishing, a big knife or a spear gun, and go for the gills and the eyes. Pretty simple. You can also eat tanifa if you cut it up, so there is that too. In terms of reproduction though, we know that they have babies, but you could also be turned into a tanifa if you were regularly interacting with them through your life such as if you were one of those priests or a medium, and even if you were drowned, you might end up taking on the form of a Tanifa in the afterlife. Tanifa were also sometimes known to have relationships with humans, so again, like our Fossy Grim and our Selkies, so a person would give birth to a Tanifa too, although I don't even want to consider the logistics of that, considering they were so large. In terms of etymology though, it's actually quite a complicated one this week, only as all the Polynesian languages have words for this monster, and the root words can mean different things in each type of language. The most agreed upon translation is from Proto-Oceanic, and it's the word Tanifa, which is spelt how it is thought of, which means shark species very literally, but it does also mean large and dangerous shark in Samoan, another Polynesian language, and in Tongan and Nuean, Tanifa means that too. In Tokelau, Tanifa is a whole other sea monster who eats people. And lastly, in other Polynesian languages, it just means shark or sometimes just fish. So it's kind of all over the place, but I love that. I think it's so amazing. And a good note as well, if you want to learn anything about the Maori language, WH is pronounced like an F in Maori, which is why I'm saying Tanifa instead of Taniwa, which I said last week, but that's how it's pronounced. That is generally how the WH sounds in Maori. So it's a good note for future. For history though, this one is a bit of a nightmare to track down, mainly because it is a native and actually nomadic culture who very much like a comparative Native American tend to keep their folklore within their own people. And so the only information we really have on this monster is from people within those cultures who are willing to share these. Unfortunately for us, it means that definitive timelines and dates are a bit tricky to come by, but we do know that the Polynesian people are nomadic, as I said, and were mostly a sea people for a good while. And the Maori eventually settled in New Zealand, between 1200 and 1300 AD, but we do not know when the Tanifa myth was actually created within this time. What we can talk about though is Maori and Polynesian folklore and what they mean against each other. So an important note is Maori is one of the Polynesian cultures because Polynesia is a collection of nationalities and cultures and it spans a much wider influence within the terms of world geography. Polynesia is a sub-region of Oceania as a continent and makes up around 1,000 different islands spread across both the central and southern Pacific Ocean, including, but not restricted to, New Zealand, the Cook Islands, Hawaii, the Easter Islands, Fuji, Samoa, Papua New Guinea, Guam and the Solomon Islands, for example. The biggest one of these, of course, is New Zealand, and all of these have separate mythologies, cultures, histories, and folklore. However, they do have a common bond and they share similar traits. 
So we use the blanket term of Polynesian mythology within classic spaces, and we stress the differences when we talk about a specific island or a specific culture within the umbrella term. When we talk about Maori mythology though, it is specific to New Zealand, or in Maori, Aotearoa. This mythology focuses on their own pantheon of gods, but as the Maori were known for their travelling and journeying through the seas, a lot of what they hold dear are animals, the land and the sea itself, and a lot of their myths talk about the creations of the islands themselves that make up Polynesia. A famous character within Polynesian mythos that most people will know is Maui, who pulled the islands from the sea, created the first coconut trees, and fought monsters. You can definitely see a Herculean type figure within him as a demigod, and you can watch some of his exploits in Disney's Moana film, which is roughly based on this nomadic culture. I won't say it's exact, but it's a good representation. However, for monsters, you might find that one Polynesian culture has one monster that is not seen in any other, or it can be spread amongst all of them, or even just some, so it's a good note for the future episodes as well. Back to the Tanifa though, there are some famous stories with these monsters, one of which I actually mentioned earlier, the creation of Wellington Harbour. The story goes that there were once two Tanifa brothers, called Nuake and Faitaite, who lived in the lake in Wellington Harbour, which at the time was cut off from the sea. The boys spent their lives lounging, eating and playing in the lake, but one day they heard the crashing waves of the sea. They would ask their friends the seabirds what it was like, and they would tell them the wonders of the open ocean. And over time, the boys did grow way too big for the little lake. One day they decided they would break free, and Nuake rolled up his tail into a spring shape and propelled himself into the cliffs around the lake. He hit one of them, and toppled the rocks down into the sea, creating what we now know as the Cook Strait. Nuake was injured, but he managed to slide over to the seaside. He was more active than his brother, and when Fatete tried, he landed in the gap forged by his brother on dry land, and unfortunately was stuck forever. The tide would wash him food and keep his scales wet, and he was content with his life and his friends the seabirds. However, one day an underwater eruption occurred, and the water raised to above sea level. Fatete couldn't do anything, and so said his goodbyes to his friends and breathed his last breath. His body eventually turned to stone, and is still there. It's now a suburb in Wellington called Hatete. However, Nuake, with his power tail, links the lake and the sea, and he still roams today. When he is out at sea, the sea is very calm around the area but when he's home, it is immensely turbulent with him hunting for fish. There are a couple of other famous Tanifa, such as Kaferi, who was tamed by a local hero called Tamure, who had a magical club in which to defeat Tanifa. A local tribe asked Tamure to get rid of Kaferi, and the two wrestled until Tamure whacked Kaferi over the head with his club, and he didn't kill him, but he managed to tame him enough to get the monster to only eat octopus and crayfish instead of people forever. Another is Araitaru, who with her 11 sons created the Hokianga Harbour, and lastly Narahura, who was a vicious Tanifa, who ate several villagers and captured one of the women to live in his cave. He eventually was tempted to the village for a feast, where they all attacked and killed him. His tail detaches itself naturally, and is thrown at the base of Wainui Falls, where the rocks are still stained to this day a reddish brown with the blood of the monster. Outside of all of these wonderful myths though, the earliest written report of the Tanifa was from 1886, from a newspaper talking about a Tanifa killing a local girl, saying that a native girl was found dead in a stream in that vicinity, with the flesh stripped from one arm and two tourists also claimed they had seen a strange creature with a head like an alligator, and a teacher saw a Tanifa swimming in a snake-like way. In more modern times though, it is still a very widely believed monster. All of these famous ones, bar the dead ones of course, are still believed to be alive and wriggling. They are most likely to be mentioned in court and on the news in New Zealand, due to habitats being developed by humanity. 
In 2012, a whole highway building plan was moved as it was proposed over a cave of a Tanifa who still had a tribe to protect. And it was moved to make way for this, that's how intense this belief is. They were even brought up in government in 2021, when the Foreign Affairs Secretary remarked about the China-New Zealand relationship as one of the Tanifa and a dragon. So it is still something that is highly respected, and also, it seems, feared. Lastly, let's talk about comparisons though. Naturally, I think most people link New Zealand with its neighbour Australia in terms of deadly animals. However, there are no crocodiles in New Zealand, but there are still sharks, including great whites in the Northern Ireland. Saying that though, I think the only possible real explanation might be large crocodiles from way back when. However, the logistics of them getting over the actual ocean to the islands seems complicated and unlikely. Whilst great white sharks can be massive, there are also basking sharks in New Zealand, which are whale-sized but completely harmless to humans, and that might explain it too. But in more mythology comparisons, we have the Mo'o from Hawaiian mythology, which of course is still Polynesian, and is a reptilian deity who can shapeshift, and it protects and kills rival tribes. I'm sure we'll cover this one at another time too. There was also a dinosaur named after the Tanifa back in 1874, called the Tanifasaurus, which was a mosasaur. So this is a very, very large crocodilian slash reptilian sea monster. It's in Jurassic World, if you fancy getting a look at it. But I think that's pretty cool, and it's a nice little homage to the monster. Now, on to modern media. We only have a few for this monster, I'm afraid. So I've topped this up with Maori mythology media because it's awesome, but I will say there are still very few on here in comparison to our other monsters, I'm afraid. For art, it is a bit limited this week, but you can look at carvings from the Hotanui Meeting House from 1878, or there are some really cool carvings of the Tanifa at Lake Tuapo, which are very, very lifelike. They look like crocodiles, they're quite creepy. Otherwise, Check out independent stuff for this week, there are some really cool native designers who have done real justice with this monster. In movies, we have Dragons, A Fantasy May Real, Moana, The Suicide Squad, Once We Were Warriors, Space Mates, and Papa Tanifa. For TV, we have Wellington Paranormal, Power Rangers Dino Charge, Island of Mystery, Tamatoa the Brave Warrior, The Monster Hunter, Mataku, Destination Truth, and Walking in the Shadows. But in video games, we have ones such as Pathfinder, Smite, Magic the Gathering, Civilization VI, Path of Exile, Guardian Maya, The Mark of Cree, and Heyu and the Tanifa. And my book recommendations this week are He Atua, He Tangata, The World of Maori Mythology by A.W. Reed and Ross Kalman, and Purakau, Maori Myths Retold by Maori Writers, by Witty Herakeis. Check some of these out for some more tales within this mythos. I think it's really amazing and it's massively understated. But now it's time for Do I think they existed? I'm a little unsure for this one, and it's not because of my normal reasons for water beasts, yada yada yada. I think it's because this one could have been a crocodile type that has been spotted over the years very rarely from Australia. I think that might be the only plausible explanation I can think of. Saying that though, there are no records of crocodiles in New Zealand at all, and obviously there are no alligators, but I think that might be the only thing I can think of. Very much like the Australian bunyip though, it chills out in water and in caves, and how much do we really know about cloudy lakes of shark inhabited water? I know for a fact I wouldn't be going in there with what might bite me, so maybe it's just the monster hasn't been tracked down enough. We just don't know. What I do love about this monster though, is that it's still having an impact today, and the Maori people are still so fierce in their beliefs and traditions, it just makes me so happy. They are really one of the very few cultures on this earth that still truly embrace their native culture, and they share it with everyone, and I just think that's so incredible, and I just love it. I get teary every time they do the haka rugby games, it's just such an amazing cultural embrace, which I think should be encouraged in every single country, in every single culture in my opinion. Embrace where we come from. But enough of me rambling, 
What do you think? Did the Tanifer lurk in the caves of New Zealand? Let me know on Twitter. I would love to know what you think about this one. What a great monster. I love New Zealand and I love the Maori culture, so it was such a joy to cover this monster. I intend to move over to New Zealand later on in life. That is very much goals. So looking into Maori monsters just makes me love it even more. I was also very surprised at the amount of content I found on this one, considering it is a native folklore. So I'm really glad I found so much to say to you on it, so you can love this one as much as me. Next week, though, we're heading over to Italy, and we're looking at a strange monster. And is it really a monster? Or is it a really unfortunate, deformed child from back in the Middle Ages? You decide with the weird monster of Ravenna next Thursday. For now, though, thank you so much for listening. It's been an absolute pleasure. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give it a rating on the service you are listening on. I've got the Twitter for any questions or suggestions on what monsters to cover next, and I'd really love to hear from you. The social media handles for TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, and threads, apparently, are Myth Monsters Podcast, and Twitter is Myth Monsters Pod. All of our content can always be found at mythmonsters.co.uk, and you can find us on Good Pods, Buy Me a Coffee, and Patreon if you want to help me fund the podcast too. Come join the fun though, share this with your pals, they might love me as much as you do. But for now, stay spooky, and I'll see you later, pipes. <laughs> <laughs>